Um, the, the focus here is not exactly precision stratified medicine as, as Steve uh, headlined. It's a person-centered care, which is, as you can imagine, a somewhat broader topic. But I'd just like to start by acknowledging Alec Isaacs, um, whom you may well know uh, was the inventor of, discoverer of the first cytokine interferon. And I mention him particularly because he was at school in Kilmarnock with my mother before the outbreak of the Second World War. We've seen this diagram a lot, haven't we? We've all got quite used to it, probably be drawing it in our sleep. Um, and I suppose the basic model is that some antigen or other stimulus is going to create chronic rhinosinusitis and that we now have certain types of lymphocytes and we have biological agents that will act on some of their activities. But if you were somebody standing back from this diagram and saying, in this cascade, where would you most like to intervene? Obviously, we might most like to intervene further upstream um, and affect more of the pathway. And I think the interventions are moving upstream. Um, GATA3 antagonists have been used uh, to show, uh, certainly in some animal experiments, and are coming on stream. But we could probably not get too tied up about the specifics of applications of individual biologicals out here, because they probably won't stay the distance that the treatments are likely to migrate uh, further up. Of course, chronic rhinosinusitis treatment is already partially private, uh, personalized. If 10% of the population of CRS in England, that means there are 6 million sufferers, as we know. The NHS budget is about 100 billion. So if we were spending 10% um, of that, um, if, if we operated on all the patients, that would equate to 10% of the NHS budget. It would cost about 10 billion pounds to operate on 6 million people. Um, obviously, we're not operating on 6 million people. We're actually operating on 15,000 people per annum, which means that even in um, over quite a number of years, quite a number of decades, there are still about 5.5 million people not having FES operations or any other sort of operations for their sinusitis. It's also worth just noting, however, that while the prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis generally in the literature has a slight female preponderance, those undergoing surgery are 69% male. And even if you exclude the, the polypectomy patients, there's still a slight male preponderance. So there, there may be some interesting uh, gender bias uh, intervention uh, movements happening here, which we have not yet explored in detail. There's a lot in popular literature about personalized medicine. This is one of the, the more prominent books. And Peter Cullis is quite a, an evangelist about it, calls it the antithesis of magical thinking, more of magical thinking anon. And his basic premise is that once we have mass spectrometry, once we can do metabolomics um, en masse, then that's going to change everything. In the same way, he says, as Galileo underpinned science with mathematics instead of religion and changed science forever. He says there are even, even believers in homeopathic medicine. We consult the high priests of medicine. Personalized medicine is going to democratize medical care and cause havoc in the medical profession. So he's obviously playing on a slightly anti-professional rift with medicine. Today, he says, if a hotel does not have good workout facilities, the guests are irate. Well, those of us who sit in NHS clinics will realise there are many millions of people in this country who will never stay, never have stayed in a hotel, far less one with good workout facilities. So it's possible that there is a hint here of some kind of medical elitism in the new science. Vitska showed this graph in her excellent um, opening address, as I'm sure you saw. And of course, the thing that strikes one looking at it is, what on earth happened here? Um, these are the years since the 9-11 disaster, where the, the World Trade Center firefighters had um, a certain prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis. And, and what happens here, of course, as you may know, is that this is where there was a change in policy for the fire department of New York and its surveillance for disease. So the presentation of disease is always complex. 
What would Peter Cullis, I wonder, make of this, where art and science meet? We like to think where we run out of science, we're practicing an art, but he might call that magical thinking. So we need to be a little bit cautious um, when we designate ourselves in areas beyond science. Not everyone will share our vision of ourselves as being artists. Yes, we have big data. It's big because of the four Vs, the volume, the velocity, the, um, the variety, but also sometimes uh, the questionable veracity. Metabolomics is possibly one of the areas which is most intuitively appealing for chronic rhinositis because of obviously we breathe through our nose and sinuses. And this is quite a recent development of a handheld sensitive breath analyzer. And one of the problems with breath sensors has been the lack of sensitivity of the sensors. But if you have protein templated rather than platinum templated nanocatalysts, then um, apparently the sensitivity is considerably increased. And so this kind of technology is coming, just as Peter Cullis says. Is that going to be coming to all of us? Well, it might just be coming to all of us, because if you look at what's happening in China, China apparently is undertaking a national campaign in certain regions of its very large territory to use big data uh, in health and medicine. And it's just possible, isn't it? We can, we're now no longer stretching the bounds of credulity. If we think, well, if China took it on and did it in the enormous Chinese population, maybe we could actually make this available to the mass market. The next question will be, of course, how these big data will interface with whole people the people coming into the clinic with their complex disorders. And uh, Nav Kara was the, the lead on a, a study we did looking at autonomic dysfunction, in particular, among other psychological factors in CRS, autonomic dysfunction, perhaps rather the Cinderella of CRS. Um, so a number of questionnaires were used, not 22, an autonomic symptom scale, a fatigue questionnaire, and scales for anxiety, depression, and other psychological parameters. Um, these were patients with nasal symptoms. They were not specific in a, a diagnostic subgroup. So the majority had CRS, nasal polyposis, perennial rhinitis, but there were some with allergy and other nasal symptoms. I think the striking thing, perhaps, when you look at the difference between participants in the study and published controls is not obviously that the SNOT 22 scale was a lot higher in the participants, or even that they were more fatigued, but that the autonomic dysfunction was considerable um, across a number of different autonomic symptoms, not just nasal autonomic symptoms, obviously. So this produced a model where there's a complex interrelationship between sinonasal symptoms, autonomic dysfunction, fatigue, somatization, depression, anxiety, and of course, some link between these and the treatments for these with autonomic dysfunction. How does that in turn feed back into big data? One aspect of the microbiome that's particularly interesting to me is not so much the general dysbiosis, but um, in the, the gut microbiome, the effect of stress. Um, yes, we know it's more important because there are more bacterial genes and DNA in our body than there are human uh, personal genomic fragments and that there's a lot more heterogeneity. But the fact that it's actually connected more centrally, possibly by autonomic stimuli, makes the microbiome particularly attractive. And looking at, again, the influence of stress, you may remember from BACO, a very important and uh, spectacular lecture by Sir Harry Burns, former Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, looking at the influence of socioeconomic status, in particular the stresses of early childhood, when childhood might be unpredictable and very stressful on subsequent life expectancy and the development of cardiovascular disease um, and even cancer. So. Uh, looking at environmental factors a little closer in, we, uh, Melanie Collins, uh, obviously now in Auckland and more in an otological sphere, did some work um, with Teen Pang on environmental risk factors and gender in nasal polyposis. 
Um, and one of the things we found, I should say, was that the, the men with polyposis um, were 66% smokers and 66% had had exposure to environmental pollutants, which may explain in the northeast of England the uh, prevalence of polyposis among men. Uh, what about smoking? Um, sm we're not quite clear what the role of smoking is in terms of the microbiome, uh, I think, f fully in the nose and sinuses. Certainly, um, it seems to protect against ulcerative colitis in the gut, deleterious for Crohn's, and in the oral cavity, the impact is unclear. Milk allergy was identified in 14% of one series of uh, patients with nasal polyposis, something worth perhaps considering. And Martin de Rossi has been writing on other aspects of diet in connection with the microbiome. So toll light receptor 4 can be stimulated by a diet high in fat and sugar, while polysaccharides, undigestible um, carbohydrates, promote good bacteria. I think you've just missed the mail plug, Sal, but I did plug mail there. Um, in the voice clinic, we are big fans of pineapple. Uh, we use it a lot to thin mucus, advising people to use fresh, non-UHT-treated pineapple juice or fresh pineapple pieces uh, to try and clear thick mucus. Um, its active ingredient is available also in capsule form. We're not sure. We have no even anecdotal evidence to know if it's as effective in capsule forms as taken orally, because obviously here we're looking at the impact directly on the oropharynx, but there's quite a literature on bromelain and no doubt we'll hear more of it. There's quite a literature on other um, anti-inflammatory dietary products as well, if you're interested in looking at it. And some of you may know where this pair of slides are going. We've got a series of herbal remedies here, vervain, yellow gentian, cowslip, the flowers of the elderberry and sorrel, and they, of course, are the active ingredients of Binorica. Binorica is not available on prescription in the UK. It is available, of course, from Amazon. And so for some of your patients, it might be uh, an alternative worth thinking about. I can't pretend that we are um, open-armed, all of us, to herbal medical remedies of this type. But why are we so resistant? Is it the influence of pharma? Have we been um, brainwashed? Is it the influence of the Peter colourist type people, the radical scientism, or is it because the expertise and the evidence base has been built up in another culture? Maybe just medics are quite resistant to change. In 1962, the Queen opened Bells Hill Hospital in Lanarkshire. 1999, she was back in Scotland again. This was the opening of the Scottish Parliament. In the same year, over in Bells Hill Hospital, a woman called Nadine Montgomery, who had diabetes, uh, was giving birth vaginally to a baby. Uh, she had discussed caesarean section with her obstetrician. Her obstetrician had not mentioned the specific risks of shoulder dystocia in diabetes, and Sam, the, the said baby, suffered cerebral palsy as a result. This case was to take about 15 years to come to the Supreme Court and lead to a dueling, uh, ruling in uh, Nadine Montgomery's favour. And Lady Hale commented, it is impossible to consider a particular procedure in isolation from its alternatives. There is always a choice. There's always a choice. And giving information is not the same as giving a choice. Welcome, as somebody said, to the century of the patient, where we were going to be making decisions together. So, in this context, we have to reflect on my beautiful leaflet, the ENT UK endoscopic sinus surgery leaflet, for example. Um, it says here, um, if you have orbital eye damage, this can cause severe swelling of the eye and can even cause double vision or, in very rare cases, loss of sight. If such a serious eye complication did occur, you would be seen by an eye specialist and may require further operations. Now, that says something, but it's not exactly painting of a scenario of what it's like to be rendered blind in one eye by endoscopic sinus surgery. I think being seen by an eye surgeon and having eye operations maybe doesn't convey enough. Certainly, um, 
we need to be a little bit more um, sophisticated in how we're delivering uh, information about surgery. We know that the evidence base about the failure of um, chronic rhinosinusitis is itself a bit of a failure. We do know that the SNOT 22 total and domain scores will predict outcome to some extent and therefore are worth measuring. And soon, of course, we may have point of care testing, whether it be by breath or by a mucosal sample, as Steve has just outlined. The elephant in the room, of course, of uh, operative consent is the risks of anaesthesia. We sign in, in the UK, the patient signs on our form for the anaesthetic, but of course we don't actually know what the risks of the anaesthetic are. We don't have much information about personalised anaesthetic risk as ENT surgeons. Um, not in, a, in Newcastle, but in a number of other centres UK-wide, there's a perioperative quality improvement programme running, hoping to perhaps define and improve the risks of surgery. So all of this complex information can be merged together in the process of shared decision making, which has been the subject of considerable research in Newcastle. You can search it under the MAGIC programme uh, with Professor Thompson. So instead of um, the information just being given to the patient, you make the decision, I've given you the information, or the surgeon or medic making the decision, there is actually a, a joint process where the information is shared. And that involves not just an opportunity to ask any questions about what I've told you, but actually giving an open invitation early on in your consultation to tell what the patient actually wants fixed. And we're not very good at that. Um, data are well known. After asking patients the concerns, physicians lis listened for a median of 18 to 23 seconds before interrupting. You may not believe that, but that's what the evidence shows. And fewer than 25% of patients made it to the end of their opening statement of concerns. It's not a great start for shared decision making. Um, but if we don't do it ourselves, then the purchasers or the lawyers will. And this review in JAMA implies that Medicaid and Medicare will only fund certain interventions or investigations if a decision aid has been used in the discussion. How do preoperative SNOT scores help us? Well, we know that if there's a score of more than 30 points, more than 75% of patients will achieve the minimal clinical important difference. The patient might ask you what that means, and nine points you may regard as not sufficient, but that's another point. Um, and they will get a mean 45% improvement in their quality of life measured by SNOT22 after endoscopic sinus surgery. If there's a score less than 20, it's not worth doing the operation. Now, this same group also looked at what was the impact of medical therapy uh, in a kind of a parallel paper. So this was a, the patients having medical therapy and those achieving the minimal clinical important difference of nine. And you can see that Again, if you've got a score less than 20 because of the floor effect, there's no point even really doing the medical therapy if you're looking for this kind of level of result. Um, and the higher you fly, the, the further you have to fall, if you like, the more people overall are likely to achieve that difference. Bad indicators then, less than 20, or as Claire Hopkins' group showed, a high sleep or psychological score. So my personal surgical outcomes are no longer to do with the surgery as much as to do with the patient. Risk communication is another important part of that, and I would say a single event probability is really meaningless because everything's 100% if it's you. It's really no consolation if there was one other person who didn't have the complication or 1,001 other people who didn't have the complication. Mathematically, a single event probability um, really doesn't hold much water. So how are we going to convey risk? I think we have to convey risk by scenarios. The obstetrician in the Montgomery case decided that there was no need to tell about shoulder dystocia because it was such an uncommon thing. But because of the nature of the scenario and the enormity of the impact, Nadine Montgomery said, if I had known, however remote that chance, that that was what living with that complication for my son was going to be like, I would never have agreed not to have the, the caesarean section. Here's Tracy Hassel. She did sign a consent form. It said there was a, a risk of uh, spinal cord damage during her cervical spine surgery. But the consent form was done in rather a rush. The consultant appeared with a hospital porter at her bedside in Mount Vernon Hospital, 
and her husband had gone to the shop to buy her something. The order of the list had been changed. It was all a bit of a fluster. She was quite anxious. She walked into Mount Vernon Hospital. She came out in a wheelchair and the judge verdict included whatever Mr. Ridgway's strengths as a surgeon when carrying out the operation, Mr. Ridgway was not a good communicator about the risks of operations and that cost uh, Mount Vernon Hospital 4.4 million. So we make our decisions under constraints of what's called bounded rationality, cognition, data and time. So cognition in terms of our um, knowledge about um, certain aspects of um, medicine and so on is obviously superior to the patient, but we're probably in common with the patient having quite poor risk literacy when it comes to discussing risks. We have the data about our treatments, but the patient has the information about values and preferences, and we're always acting under constraints of time. So I think, um, Given the constraints of time, um, I will end on this point and say if you don't have time for the patient to give consent, you don't have time to do the operation. Thank you very much.